Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway. Today I'm very excited because I have an all new, brand new Backman tank engine to unbox and review for you. Today's locomotive was announced way back in 2017 and ever since it started appearing on the various retailers websites I have been really really looking forward to it and within the last few days the locomotive has been released and amazingly I've been able to pick one up. So the locomotive is this, it is the Backman Johnson 1P tank engine or it's also known as the Midland Railway 1532 class and as you can see it's a very very handsome little 044 tank engine, in fact I cannot wait to get this out and see what this is like. So I bought this from Rails of Sheffield and they had more or less the best price on the market, it was £127.45 I believe, although the RRP from Backman was £100. £149.95. Now obviously for a reasonably small 044 tank engine that is quite a lot of money. In fact it's around £20 more expensive than Hornby's 044 H-Class, the SECR H-Class and I choose that for comparison because like I say it's a similar 044 tank engine and it was also announced the same year back in 2017 so the prices should be comparable. Needless to say then, I will be expecting to see that £20 reflected in the quality, in the detail, in the performance of this model. Hopefully there will be £20 worth of improvements in this model in order for this to justify the price tag. However, obviously Backman's more recent releases have been very, very good quality, so I do have high expectations for this one. Needless to say, of course, given the price. So we will get this out, let's find out what it's like, and fingers crossed it's a good one. Waited a long time for this one. Here we go. So first things first, as you can tell, they've been able to cram this into a reasonably small box, which is pretty impressive and economical. It's probably only, you know, a matter of five centimetres or so, shorter than the box of, let's say, the LYR Class 5 tank engine. But if you imagine that a thousand of these packed into a shipping container, cutting out that five centimetre chunk will save masses of space. So, yeah, quite impressed to see that Backman have uh, been so efficient in that. Let me show you the end of the box then. I'll show you the version I have here. This is the coveted one. I think it's 31-740 Midland Railway, that's what the MR stands for, it's not a mister. Uh, 1532 class 1273, that's the running number. It's in the Midland Railway Crimson Lake and it does support a next generation 18-pin DCC decoder, so if you want to chip it that's what you will need. And this version I believe has practically sold out everywhere, so hopefully this is a good model and hopefully Backman will make more, and then everybody that wants one will have a chance of getting one. That would be nice. There's also, I believe, BR Black and LMS Black versions available too. Both look absolutely lovely as well. Let me show you the back of the box then, because there is a potted history of the 1P on the back. As always, if you'd like to, feel free to pause and read that, although I will give you some history in just a second. Oh, I've not been this excited for it. It's been... I suppose the Dapol Mogul was the last new release, but before that one, there was, it's been a long time. So, yeah, let's get this out and let's savour this because it's the first new Batman logo in a long, long time. I think the E1 was the last one and that was almost a year ago. Right, I've got the sleeve off. You can see what a lovely thing this is. It's actually quite short. I would, at a guess, say that's even shorter than the Hornby H class. But yeah, it's just handsome, isn't it? It's just such a nice compact shape. I would have guessed that that was like a, an 060 maybe. It's probably not that much larger than a Ginty. And I do like that. I love smaller locos. Let's get the pack out then and see what this is like. It, it's difficult to get a sense of the weight at the moment. So I suppose ooh, we'll find that out. Right, so we've got a wadge of paperwork that's dropped out. I'll just grab the top one at random. So this one is product maintenance and care, running in period. Yes, this one does require a short running in period. It says, does it say 30 minutes? Well, that's about what I do anyway. Cleaning and maintenance, lubrication, it says after every 24 hours of running, that's fine. Is there anything specific? Doesn't seem there's anything specific to the loco in that pack, so hopefully there will be something. Ah, yes, here we go, this is a bit better. So this one looks specific to the Midland Railway 1532 class. Let's take a look, locomotive information. Some interesting things in there, you can see it has got a cordless motor inside. I've had mixed results from cordless motors, although the last few I reviewed, the BT Well tank I think was the last one, they did run well, so maybe I'm warming to them a little bit. Accessories, that shows you how to fit the accessories, well that's fine, there seems to be quite a few of them, so potentially quite a bit of work for you to do if you buy one of the 
these, although looking at it, some of those buffer beam details might uh, clash with the couplings if they were fitted from the factory. So I guess we can give them a pass on that. And then inside, let's see, lubrication. Well, that's fine. It's just a diagram shows where to lubricate. Changing the wheel sets. Now, as I understand it, there is an alternative wheel set which has traction ties on it. So if you want your loco to pull even more, then you can fit that. And as you can see, there's a bit of work to do. You have to take off the base keeper plate, remove the crank pins, switch the wheels over, line up the bearings. It seems like quite the job, but perhaps worth it if you want the extra pulling power, although I'm not a fan of traction ties, so I don't expect I'll be doing that. Maybe for review purposes, I might try it if I've got time. Uh, DCC sound and fitting, so that looks like body removal, perhaps. It shows you the insides, there's that coilless motor. Yeah, that's quite nice, isn't it? And then we've also got a firebox glow and flicker. Now, Dapol have produced some really good, well, in the Terrier, they had a really good firebox flicker. The one in the Mogul wasn't very good at all, at least not on DC. So I wonder which one this will be like. Will it be like the Terrier or the Mogul? Well, I guess we'll find out. Anyway, enough of the instructions. Man, I spent far too long on those. Let's push the tray out and see what we have in the accessories bag. So, I mean, the thing that stands out is obviously the set of wheels with the traction ties on. Note that the traction ties are not fitted as standard. Well, this would suggest that anyway. So the set that is fitted to the Loco does not have traction ties. And I think based on a poll I did a few weeks ago, look at this, I think that is the way most people would prefer it. So good job, Backman, good choice. I would do that on future releases too, <laughs> President. And as you can see, we have what look like cab doors. A lot of this was all sort of referred to in the instructions, so there's no sort of big mystery as to what all of this stuff is, although some of it's quite obvious, isn't it? There's buffer beam details and couplings and such. Yeah, that's all absolutely fine, but let's have a look at the star of the show. I'll tell you what, this feels heavy, folks. I don't know. I mean, usually with Batman, you get the die-cast running plates. Are we going to have a die-cast boiler on this? It feels likely, given the weight, and wow. The finish on that is stunning. And this is something I don't think I've done justice in the past. The actual texture and finish of the boilers and other aspects of Backman Locos are really, really nice. And some other manufacturers, sometimes even Hornby, they can't quite capture that, but Backman do tend to. Right, well, here it is. And this is one handsome beast, isn't it? I think the finish is just what hits me. It's obviously really handsome and really nicely detailed, but the fact that it's finished off with this beautiful satin sheen is really, really impressive. And that is something that hits you with quite a few models. That Dapol Mogul was the same as well. It's just the, the finish is exquisite. Now, as I expected, the running plate is clearly made of metal and it's quite dense and heavy as well. I mean, there's a lot of weight to that. It's very cold to the touch. It feels as though the coal bunker, the water tanks, the boiler, it feels as though those are all made of plastic but I really don't have an issue with how much this weighs. This, well, I can't tell. I'll have to weigh it for sure to find out. But this does feel heavier than the Hornby H-Class, and it feels much, much more quality as a result. I reckon I'm going to really, really like this. Just look at it. That is gorgeous. Right, I think we're going to have a good day today, provided it looks this good up close, and provided the mechanism's really good as well, and it performs nicely. I reckon this loco is going to get a very, very good score just looking at it. That's my gut instinct. Right, we will find out. First, though, here comes a little bit of history on the class if you were interested. Also known as the Midland Railway 1532 class, as I say, the Johnson 1P consisted of 65044 tank engines built by Samuel W. Johnson between 1881 and 1886. The class was constructed at Derby Works and they shared many components with previous designs such as the Type C boiler from the older class 1252 and 6 class. With attractive effort in the region of 69 kilonewtons, they were soon outperformed by other 044 designs such as the later SECRH class or the LSWR M7 class, to name just a couple of them produced in 00 gauge. Nevertheless, the design remained in service for an incredible 75 years, and all but three examples survived into the LMS period following the grouping of 1923. One of these was actually transferred to the S and DJR, and Backman have actually produced that version for their collectors club. Although withdrawal began back in 1919, the final example was not removed from service until 1956, although regretfully all examples were scrapped with no survivors. So there it is then, up close and personal for you, the Backman Johnson 1P. And I'm really pleased to report that under closer inspection, this model appears to be every bit as immaculate as it seemed from a distance when I first pulled it out of the box. 
it just screams quality. It really does. It's just been put together so, so perfectly. And to be perfectly honest with you, even though, yes, this is quite an expensive model, I'm beginning to feel like you get exactly what you pay for. And that is all I could ever ask for, isn't it? That is all I ever ask. So let's take a close look at this thing. First of all, we'll talk about the weight. Thanks to that very chunky die cast running plate, this weighs in at 193 grams, which isn't dreadfully heavy for a locomotive of this size, but it is indeed heavier than the Hornby H class, which weighed in at 164 grams. So that is 29 grams lighter than this. It really isn't too light. I thought it would be with all this talk of traction tires, but actually it isn't too bad. I mean, it's not the heaviest in the world. It's a bit lighter than the Helgen 07 Shunter, and it's only just less than 20 grams heavier than the much smaller E1 locomotive. I can't help but thinking if perhaps the water tanks or the boiler had been made of metal and the weight brought up to say 250 grams, then the traction tyre idea could have been discarded already because I think the pulling power then would have been quite reasonable. But as it is, no, the loco is not too light. Let's take a look first of all at the decoration then, which is, I just, I can't fault it. I really cannot fault it. Look at the tanks. You've got the lovely orange lining around the tanks there. You've got the Midland Railway print work going on, which just looks fine. It doesn't matter how closely you inspect that. It just looks fine. So do the running numbers as well. The side of the coal bunker has got some print work on there. My close-up lens should be able to read what that says for you. You can see that. The buffer beams, again, there's some lovely painted detail on the buffer beams. I would draw your attention to the vacuum pipes. Look at these. The part of the vacuum pipe that lines up with the buffer beam is actually painted red, and you've got the black above and below that. It's just incredible attention to detail, really. The same thing goes, again, with the splashes. You can see how marvellously complex the decoration is around those. It's really quite a pleasure just to look at this model up close and take in some of these different details. Even the wheels, look, the wheels have been lined and it's quite tidily done as well. I can't really fault the way those wheels have been lined. Although I should say you haven't got these sort of properly moulded wheels. You can see the axles through there. And if I bring up a Wikipedia image of the real thing, the wheel centres don't look quite like that, but they have all been blacked out. So from any sort of distance, they don't look unrealistic in any way whatsoever. The smoke box door has received a few tampo prints as well, as you can see there. That all looks tickety-boo, doesn't it, really? Even the buffers look, just where the metal buffers connect with the buffer housing. They've been lined as well, and I really love the material that these buffers are made out of. It's sort of almost like a chrome-plated effect on those. And yes, of course, the buffers are sprung, look there. And speaking of the sort of high shine chrome effect, you've also got that with the handrails. On some models, that doesn't look particularly good, <coughs> as we know. On this one, it does. It matches the livery so beautifully, and it makes the loco look so grand, doesn't it? And there are lots of small separately fitted details as well. You've got another, what looks like another metal handrail on the side of the water tank there. You've got valves and the accompanying pipe work coming out of the side of the boiler, which does seem to connect down to something on the running plate. It doesn't just connect to nothing, which is great. Underneath the boiler, you can see we have got some sort of representation of the valve gear between the frames, which is really nice. They've not just left that space blank. Now, that's a quality feature, isn't it? It must be said. The brake rigging, it, it's either very good quality plastic or metal because it does not shift. You can put your fingers to it. It does not move. It's very good quality, which is great. That's not the case all over the model, though. As you can see, this bonnet on top of the boiler is quite clearly made of plastic. Perhaps a bit of metal work there would have been nice. Same thing goes with the whistle. Although when you make whistles and things out of metal, it seems, well, looking at other models, that you lose a little bit of the finesse. So obviously they've gone for a more realistic form as opposed to a more realistic finish, but overall it's not too bad. And around the dome, again, you can see the metal work here. It does look a bit plasticky, but it's not terrible. It doesn't look bad. It's reasonably glossy, actually. It's not far from a metallic finish, really. Now, the cab is very nicely done. If I show you inside the cab, you can see there are lots of details inside there, many of them separately fitted and many of them separately painted. As you can see though, the glazing pieces go right the way through. The windows in the cab here are not individually glazed, which is a little bit cheap, isn't it? Perhaps with a loco of this price tag, you'd expect individually glazed windows. The downside to the larger glazing pieces is that you've got this very noticeable plastic which runs right the way through, and it does spoil the intricacy of the cab a little bit, and the same is true on the back. When a loco is this expensive, you really want them to pull out all of the stops. I would say that this, combined with the lack of metalwork in some areas, means that they haven't quite pulled out all of the stops, but I would say they've pulled out enough of them to make a very, very impressive model. Having said that, I must say I really like the grill effect on the rear-facing windows. Really quite a nice effect, that. I'm not sure how they've done it 
are those bars molded into the transparent acrylic and then painted? I've no idea, it looks good though. Right, let's finish off here then, let's take a look in the coal bunker now. Notice the coal bunker hasn't been filled to the brim, although there is a load inside there. Whether that's removable or not, I'm not entirely sure. However, the fact that it's not filled to the brim means that you could just add your own coal on top of that and that would be a nice easy job. Around the back you can see we have yet another separately fitted vacuum pipe as well as separately fitted lamp brackets, which are all nice and square, none of them are wonky. And the same is true for all of the other separately fitted details on the model really. Very, very nicely put together. I must say the finesse of this model is marvellous, very much so. You can see the joint where the boiler joins the chassis. The body doesn't marry perfectly to the chassis there. And we have seen that quite a few times. I do believe that's what's going on there. But it is low enough down on the boiler to make it quite unnoticeable. And obviously you've only got this tiny gap here where that is visible. It's not as though you've got a long section of exposed boiler, uh, which would be very noticeable, of course. Well, I don't believe I've looked at all of the details, but hopefully you get a sense of them. Very, very nicely put together. And I do feel as though I got what I paid for when I bought this model, and that is a quality model, nicely put together, a thoughtful model. They've added traction tires, but only alternative ones because they know that people aren't that keen on them. Yeah, I really, really like this. Now, I've not really looked into the mechanism too much, so that is the next job. I'm going to do that. Then we'll get this down onto the track and figure out what this locomotive is really like as a running locomotive. So there it is then, Backman's beautiful Johnson 1P down onto the track, and I'm really excited about this one now. It's growing on me, looks fantastic, and now that I've seen the mechanism, I'm feeling even more confident about this one. So the mechanism is good. I'm impressed. It's surprisingly good. Let's start with the pickups then, because this loco has all wheel pickups, including on the non-driven bogey wheels, which means you've got four pickups going to each of your two rails. That's really, really good. Although bear in mind, if you do choose to fit the optional rubber traction tyres, you'll then only have just three pickups going to each rail, because obviously the rubber does not conduct. Now that would usually be fine, provided every pickup is making good contact. Unfortunately, though, that is not the case with my model as you can see if we look at the pickups going to the non-driven rear bogey you can see that the pickups are clearly not making good contact with the wheels in fact the wheels don't have to travel very far to break free of the pickups which means i reckon you could see reliability issues when you fit the traction tires however the driving wheels do make much better contact with the pickups as you can see so i don't think we'd have any issues there speaking of the rear bogey the way this pivots is quite unusual you would expect it to pivot on the center where that screw is but look at this it does not it pivots like the old style sort of trying M7 does, which is interesting, that's very good. And also, it seems minor, but it's quite important to me really, when you lift the loco off the track, that rear bogey doesn't sort of dangle all over the place. And I think that's actually quite important because if you pick up a model and there are bits dangling and sort of loose, it doesn't feel very quality, does it? However, this more secure connection is a lot better. A little bit about gauging then. So the back-to-back -back I measured 14.6 millimeters, which is about in line with other Backman locos I have. That's around 0.15 or 0.2 millimeters too tight, according to the 00 gauge association. Although because of the base flange width at 0.8 millimeters, the front to back gauge comes out at more or less about right at 15.13 millimeters. So the gauging I don't think will be much of an issue, although when we test it, obviously we'll find out for sure. Right, so the disassembly wasn't too bad. It was three screws to remove the body, plus an extra one to remove the NEM coupling mount, which also has to be removed. There's the motor, as you can see, it is a coreless motor, but it's a very large, substantial one. Not at all like the silly little thing that was in the BT well tank. Puzzlingly, no flywheel though, which is a pity, particularly as coreless motors tend to have very low inertia because of how little mass there is on the armature. So we'll have to see how we go on that. The wire management isn't particularly impressive. As you can see, we've got wires all over everywhere. And that wire in particular looks as though it's about ready to break already, doesn't it? So if the thing doesn't work, that will be what I suspect. As you can see, there's an opening here where the firebox would be and above that area you can just about see it. I think we have two LEDs there which means they're not pointing through the firebox so you're not going to get very very bright lights like we saw on the Terrier but hopefully if those LEDs are bright enough we should at least be able to see them as the model runs normally and also removing the base keeper plate reveals that we do have proper metal bearings which is a really good quality touch so besides a few minor niggles mainly with the pickups not making proper contact the mechanism here seems to be really really good so let's give this a test then I should 
say at this point it does not have the wheel set with the rubber tyres fitted. This is as it came straight out of the box. This will be its first ever test, so please cross your fingers at home. Here we go, I've set it to forwards. Let's slowly turn this up and see how it runs. And this has not yet been running. <laughs> and having said that, wow. Look at that. Has it stalled? No. Well, it did stall, but it, it saved itself without me touching it. It's on the express points now, and it has cut out. Let's give it a little bit of a hand then. All right. So already I'm seeing a few signs that continuity with the track might be a problem. But away from the points, I can't criticise the way that runs. That is so nice and smooth, straight out of the box with no running in. And the instructions did say this one needed a period of running in, so the fact that it's running that well is making me confident. Shall we put it that way? Very much so. Let's try it on the points again. Okay, well, it got over them that time. Yeah, I'm sure that as those pickups wear in and the sort of surface oxidisation gets rubbed off, I'm sure they will conduct a lot better, except the ones that aren't making contact. But we'll see. If they prove to be a problem, I might have to try and adjust them. But I don't fancy that too much because the best way to do it is by removing the wheels. Oh, it shouldn't be too difficult. They're just clipped in there. We'll see how we go then. That is reasonably easy to fix then if you remove the wheels and bend the pickups slightly to make better contact. Although bear in mind if you do that, if you go too far with that and they put too much pressure on the wheels, that can stop them turning and obviously it looks a bit bad if the rear wheels are locking up. So at least it's not doing that. Right, is the Firebox Glow working? Yeah, as you can see there is no flickering, at least not on DC. However, the light is nice and subtle, but probably just about enough to catch your attention if your head was in a very specific position. Otherwise, it's a nice gimmick. I love the fact that it's there, but it's not terribly effective, is it? Let's be honest. However, no complaints. It's a nice little touch of realism. And on DCC, it would be quite nice knowing that you can open and close the firebox by switching on and off that light. It's a pretty cool feature. The performance, I'm gonna be honest and say, seems absolutely fine and i'm seeing this quite a bit with cordless motors uh, they they do seem to be performing better and better the more i use them helped obviously by the fact that i no longer use a feedback controller right let's get that crawl then i think we're crawling there are we hmm. there we go look <laughs> And of course, because there is no actual valve gear and pistons and things to operate on this model, the friction in the drive system is quite a lot lower as well. Um, so there's nothing to lock up and have tight spots. And that does seem to be doing this model a good service. Look at that. Seems pretty constant, doesn't it, reasonably? And I'm sure that will only improve as the thing gets run in. Yeah, that is nice. That's nice. Let's have a look what the medium speed is like. Let's set it to 50, shall we? Yeah, that's not too bad. A little bit speedy perhaps, but the low speed control is definitely there. So I'm not going to complain about the gearing too much, I don't think. Right, let's get it to run at 50% around the layout then, and we'll take a look and see how it gets on. So as you can see, this is running really, really nicely. Very, very smooth, it must be said. And it's also fairly quiet. The last Backman Loco I reviewed, the E1, was quite noisy, I seem to remember. This one isn't. This one is actually much quieter, I would say. It's not silent or anything, but uh, the noise is certainly not the unhealthy kind, and it seems more than happy as it runs along. So I have no suspicion that there's something wrong, like I have with other Locos. No, this one seems to be really, really happy. It's completing the layout without derailing or anything like that. All of the curves, it seems to be fine on. No slowing down on any of the curves either, although it is running a bit fast at the moment. We'll see if that changes when I slow it down a little bit and add some coaches. Although I have a good feeling about this because the torque seems fine, doesn't it? I mean, it's got to have a reasonable amount of torque in order to run so nicely at those incredibly slow speeds, having not even been run in. So this is exciting. I would start feeling confident about this one, folks because all of the boxes seem to be ticked, really. The pulling power isn't going to be a problem because if it doesn't pull very well, I'll just fit the tyres and then it gets a tick on pulling power. We've got a bit more testing to do, but it's looking really, really good. So I'll let this run in in both directions and I'll come back to you in a few minutes and I'll deliver a more informed verdict. 
Okay, there we go. And I must say, that was an absolute joy to watch run. Over that whole running in period, it never once derailed or stalled on any points. Absolutely fine. I also tried it running along much more slowly at something like 25 or 30 speed setting on the controller. And as you can see, even on that killer curve, it did not slow down in the slightest, which just shows what a quality mechanism this one is. I'm not a big fan of cordless motors, but I cannot fault the way this one runs, so it cannot lose any marks for that. The pulling power wasn't actually too bad. I have tested this. I was expecting it to be terrible because they've gone to the trouble of including traction tyres, but it actually wasn't. I measured 0.18 newtons of pulling force, which should allow this loco to haul around 14 coaches on straight and level track, and that's about the same as the Oxford Dean Goods or the Hornby J15. Those are 060 locomotives, so it isn't doing too bad. But of course, my layout is neither straight nor level, so I have set up five Pullman coaches, and it will be very interesting to see if she can haul all of those around the layout without traction tyres. First though, let's try the slow speed crawl and performance now that she's been running. She's parked evilly right on an express point here, so this will really be a good test of the continuity. Let's go. There we go, driving wheels over the dead zone. Now there's no reason why this should lose power because it has all-wheel pickup, but it has. I've now turned that up to 50% speed. I'm going to slam on the ground. There we go, it's gone. So, yes, I reckon I will have to remove those bogey wheels. <laughs> and when I do fit the traction tyres eventually, I reckon that's going to be even more of an issue than the cutting out. So, yes, I think it's going to be absolutely essential that those rear bogey wheels are picking up properly. Let's try it again a little bit faster. Okay, so it seems to have survived that time. So it isn't sort of cutting out reliably, and I would say it's quite nasty to run a loco like this over express points at such a low speed. So, yeah, I mean, this is very much a worst-case scenario. And overall, to be fair to it, it isn't handling this too badly at all. Let's go again. Maybe that was a one-off, because it hasn't cut out since, has it? Nope. Nope. That was fine. Got over there. As you can see, the slow speed is all right, isn't it? It's not dreadfully smooth, but it is very, very slow. Look at that. Yeah, I mean, it's good. That's fine. It's absolutely fine. I just, I, something not dreadfully smooth about it. And there we are. It's cut out again. Let's give it a nudge this time. Yeah. But like I say, that's on express points. On normal track, let's pull it back a little bit off the point and move you with it. This is normal track. I don't think it really does it, even over the sort of joints in the track. It doesn't stop. There. Backwards. Yeah, it's fine, isn't it? And there's not too much flop in the coupling rod either. A little bit, but not too much. As you can see, the driving wheel starts just before. Ah, oh, it's cut out again now. There we go. <laughs> so yeah, because of the poor continuity in the bogey, you do see the odd bit of cutting out if you're really being nasty and crawling with it. But I think for most practical applications, this is not going to be a problem. Although, as I say, if you want to fix it, it's easily adjusted. Right, let's go and couple up to those five Pullmans then and see if she can haul them. I don't think she can. All right, steadily does it. I've chosen these poor ones because they are the slightly older kind and they do have plastic wheels. So once again, this is going to demonstrate to you a worst case scenario because there is quite a bit of drag in these coaches. So let's see if she can handle them. Let's accelerate reasonably gently. And as you can see, with only a little bit of wheel slip, she's actually managing those quite nicely. Let's accelerate. There we go, up to 50 and try her on Gordon's Hill, shall we? So as you can see on the straight track, she was absolutely fine with these Pullmans, but now she's got to the hill, it's becoming a real struggle and I'm not keen on her doing that. So I'm gonna go and stop her straight away. Okay, so with five coaches, that is as far as she got. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to demonstrate to you how you fit the axle with the traction tyres fitted. Now, just a little bit of a disclaimer, I am not intending to use my model with the traction tyres. I think at some point when I've got time after I finish this review, I'll take the traction tyres back out again and fit the standard set of wheels. And I'll just live with the fact that she's not going to be able to handle massive numbers of coaches. I personally think that traction tyres should only really be used as a truly last resort when there's absolutely no other way of increasing traction. Well, I think with the plastic water tanks and the plastic boiler, Backman did have other options to increase the traction. However, they did choose to use the traction tyre solution, uh, which is, I suppose, a more cost-effective solution, but at £149.95 RRP, we're not really looking for cost-effective solutions, we're looking for quality solutions. But the traction tyres are a nice inclusion, so I will demonstrate the fitting now and see how easy it is to do. 
Just a short disclaimer then as I take out the base keeper screws, I do not recommend trying this if you are a beginner or if you're not used to tinkering with model locomotives. I have heard this process described as very easy, you can just slot in the wheels, but that is not true. It's very, very fiddly. It's quite easy to get the crank pins out, but can be very difficult to get them back in again. It's not at all a very user-friendly solution. However, it is a solution, so I suppose credit where credit's due. So there are five screws to remove. You have to remove the coupling first, as you will have seen, and then the base keeper plate comes out. Be careful of the guard irons slash sanding pipes as you do that, just in case you upset those. The next job after that is of course to remove the crank pins. Now Backman did talk about a tool that they provide. I don't have one of those. Maybe their tool will make this process easier. But the tool I use is a 2.5mm nut spinner as you can see here. And you can use that tool to quite easily unscrew the crank pins and put them to one side. They're very easy to lose though so be very careful. Then it's just a case of removing the old wheel set, bearings and all, you just take the whole thing out. And then of course it's a case of finding the detail bag which has the alternative set of wheels inside. Now make sure these go in the right way, I don't think it's possible to get it in the wrong way because the gear isn't in the centre of the axle so it won't fit in the wrong way. You need to make sure the bearings line up properly, again this is quite a fiddly job, they are difficult to get in position sometimes, but they do slot in eventually once you get that sweet spot and you get the position just right. Then you've got the fun part, oh crikey, so you've got to line up the coupling rod onto the shaft, there's a small small collar for that coupling rod to sit onto, it might be best to turn the loco onto the side while you do this, and then you've got to get the crank pin threaded and that is the difficult part. Once it is threaded I find it easier to do that part with the fingers, you can of course tighten it up with the 2.5mm nut spinner, you only want them to be finger tight, there isn't going to be any force applied to these crank pins really so they don't need to be ultra tight and you, you certainly don't want to damage anything in this area because it could seriously upset the running. Okay so you repeat that process for the other side, I had a, it took a few goes, it does take a few goes and I've done this a hundred times, this actually looks reasonably easy, my demonstration but trust me you need some practice to get this reliably done okay so once they are in that is almost job done don't forget if you intend to leave the traction tire wheel set in there you will need a little bit of lubrication because it does not appear that the alternative axle was lubricated at the factory so you want a little bit of oil around the bearings and then your choice of grease on the gear I didn't actually put any grease on the gear because I intend to take out this wheel set after the review and I'm hoping that the grease from the other gears will just spread onto that so that should be fine if you're planning to leave in there yeah apply a little bit of grease I use silicon grease and it works fairly well once that job is done you've got the slightly tedious task of refitting the base keeper plate again you just need to make sure that the various sanding pipes and guard irons and that kind of thing they all need to go over the top of the base keeper plate which is a bit fiddly but it goes on in the end then of course it's a case of replacing all of the screws, screw them in just a little bit to start with and then tighten them all up once they're all in and then finally you replace the coupling mount and then the very last step is fitting in the coupling itself and that I believe is job done. So let's get this down onto the track and see what the difference is in performance. Alright, I'm very carefully putting this back onto the track and straight away as you push the loco along on the track very slightly, you can feel that the traction is going to be much, much greater. Let's see how it runs then. Is it actually going to work at all? Oh yes it is. It seemed to limp a little bit over that point though, straight away. Yeah. <laughs> and again. Mm. So, is that a cause for concern, I wonder? It doesn't seem too bad, does it? Is it going to stop on the dead zone now? It struggled over there, but it didn't actually stop. So that's reasonably impressive. It seems that the traction tyres haven't really made too much of an impact on the continuity with the rails. I did expect them to. And actually, as the thing runs in and the wheels get a little bit dirtier, I would certainly expect it to. But right now, it seems absolutely fine, I would say. Oh, <laughs> oops. No, that's dead. Here we go. Let me push it. Ready? There we go. <laughs> Yeah, but it's no worse than it was before it was doing that anyway. How is it at speed, or a bit higher speed? Yeah, that's all right, isn't it? It's not too bad. There we go. Right, let's go and couple to the Pullmans then. Let's see if it can now handle five of them. Hmm, it is having a tendency to limp. Did you see that? Anyway, right, so there should be no wheel slip now. And I've also measured, by the way, a new tractive effort of 0 0.8 newtons, which is a little bit scary, given the propensity of coreless motors to overheat. So you want to be... Oh, 
it cut out there. So you want to be very, very careful not to overload this with the traction tyres fitted because it will handle around 45 coaches on straight and level track, which you should not do. You can upset motors if they get too warm and overloaded. Right, the moment of truth. Can we handle five Pullmans now that it has the traction tyres? I think the answer should be reasonably obvious, but let's check. Yes, quite clearly it can with no problems whatsoever. So, I mean, this is really good. I don't like traction tyres, but it is really, really good that Backman have catered for everybody here. If you don't like traction tyres, you don't have to put up with them. But if you want to fit those in, if you want the extra pulling power, this model does have the facility to accommodate you, which I think is really, really good. Less good is the fact that I really don't like the performance of this model now. Even though it's only done perhaps one or two laps now, I'm already starting to see the thing stuttering on points and curves, and it's just got a bit of a funny limp to it. It does not run as well with the traction tyres fitted. And there we go, it stopped entirely now. So I am more or less going to swap those straight back. I'm not a fan of those tyres. They do work and they will obviously do what they're designed to do and increase the traction of the locomotive, but it's just not for me. So I'll come back to you in a second when that is done and hopefully the thing will work properly again once those tyres are gone. So that is it, job done. The original wheels are now back into the 1P and so it's now back into original condition. And now we're going to change mode. Before we were in, let's test the loco mode. And now we're moving into, let's enjoy this beautiful model mode. So I've set up some slightly more appropriate coaches, I suppose, some of these small four wheelers. I think they're a good choice because they're not very heavy. They've only got four wheels, so the friction should be a little bit less, which means the 1P can handle quite a good number of these uh, without struggling too much on gradients and such so let's enjoy this beauty then and my goodness it is a beauty here we go let's go a bit slower now set it to about 30 speed and yes the gearing is a little bit high on this loco it does run a little bit fast uh, but I'm not going to criticize that today because it can still do the crawl and the crawl is getting better and better by the way it's now very very smooth indeed so running in does seem to help. Anyway, on the middle line, we have a request. This is from Shining Time 4, who wanted to see the S and DJR 7F with some Southern coaches. So that's a very unusual idea. So thank you very much for that request, Shining Time 4. And then on the inside line, we have another request. This one is from Sean Johnson, who wanted to see the J36 with a good strain. Now, I think Sean might have asked for Maud but we're on DC mode today because the 1P is in DC. So I've had to choose the LNER J36, but I hope that is all right for you, Sean. And I have been able to set up the good strain as you requested. So let's watch the 1P run then and let's enjoy it a little bit, shall we? So I would say this is one of my best and by far most beautiful Backman locomotives by a country mile. Sometimes I am very critical of Backman and I do believe that is deserved, but it must be said when they spend the money and tool up a brand new locomotive, as they did with the E1 and those Atlantics, they make a fantastic locomotive. And like I say, I think this one is possibly the most fantastic of them all. I absolutely love it. It just works in every area, doesn't it? There are no niggles, there's no buts in this review, really. It's just a great looking model. And it was expensive, but it was worth it. It was worth it. I cannot wait just to, it's just one of those locos that I'm going to grab off the shelf and put onto the layout, hook it up to some nice coaches and just enjoy it. And that's how you know when you've got a good model because you're not worried about the little quirks that it's got, you're not worried about damaging it because it's been built to a poor standard, it just does what it's supposed to do. And when a loco is fit for purpose and just gorgeous like this one is, it's okay to spend the money on it, isn't it? It's okay if the asking price is up there because this model lives up to its expectations. I had high expectations for the model when I opened the box and those expectations were met and in some places exceeded. I absolutely love it. Well done, Backman. And thank you, Backman. Thank you for showing us what you can do. It's magical. Very, very good indeed. So here comes some of my ratings then for the Backman Johnson 1P. And as you can see, wow, what a fantastic score. And this loco thoroughly, thoroughly deserves it. Now, before I start, I should say that this score is based on the loco as it comes out of the box. That is to say, without the traction tires fitted. Had Backman chosen to fit the traction tires as standard, then the score would have been lower. So they're quite lucky there, I suppose. 
Right, the level of detail I have given 4.5 stars. Overall, the level of detail was marvellous. The finish was absolutely fantastic. So many separately fitted parts. Everywhere you look, the model looks super realistic, including between the frames. I loved the decoration. The lining is just absolutely marvellous. And the firebox flicker, it gets extra points for that. A couple of things did let it down. The slightly unrealistic cab window situation wasn't great. But overall, those are very, very small complaints and not enough to knock off a whole star, I don't think. Performance, I have been generous here and given it five star, as I say, because I'm rating this as it came out of the box. Out of the box, it's not dreadfully powerful. However, it is really, really nice and smooth, particularly now that it's been running incredibly smooth, in fact. The slow speed is phenomenal, and despite having one or two issues with the pickups on the rear bogey, it does actually run very, very reliably, even over express points overall. So I think, in general, the performance does deserve five star. The pulling power out of the box is 14 coaches, uh, what was the tractive effort, 0.18 newtons, that was straight out of the box. However, if you were to add the traction tyres, you add an extra 31 coaches, which is insane, although bear in mind there are downsides to having the traction tyres. I don't recommend it, but they're there if you want them. The mechanism then, I've just knocked off half a star for the lack of flywheel. I think a flywheel would have made this model a lot better because it is a little bit snappy to control this, uh, particularly with the traction tyres. The change in speed of the wheel set is very dramatic, particularly on the slowdowns. And also a flywheel can help to smoothen out the motion of a motor, which does make a difference to the overall performance of a model. However, otherwise the mechanism is really good. I have to applaud their use of the coreless motor. I'm not a big fan of them and I don't like that you can't use them on feedback controllers, or rather you shouldn't because you could damage them. However, the performance itself cannot be faulted, and so I can't complain about the coreless motor. Otherwise, the mechanism's really, really nice as well. You've got the proper turned metal bearings on the wheel set, that's quality. All wheel pickup, even though some of the pickups are a little bit ineffective, although they can quite easily be fixed, so no marks docked there, perhaps that's a bit generous. The quality then, again, I've given 4.5 star. This was very, very nearly perfect because the build quality was second to none. No glue marks in sight. The decoration was absolutely on point. Everything that was fitted to the model was done so perfectly. The only things I would criticize is perhaps the lack of die cast in the boiler and side tanks. Like I said earlier on, if they'd have been made of metal, then it would have handled my five Pullmans without any problems and the whole traction tire headache could have been avoided. And also the other quality issue, slight, very slight, was the pickups on the rear bogey, which I'm not keen on and I'm gonna fix those at some point. They may not be typical of every example, but it certainly was typical with mine because basically every single pickup on that bogey was not adjusted as I would have adjusted it. But overall, I'm only gonna knock off half a star for that because overall I think the quality I think was really, really good. Now, value for money then. It's a tricky one because at £149.95 RRP, this is a very expensive model, and as I say, I paid £127.45 from Rails of Sheffield. So it is a lot of money, but the category says value for money, not just cost. And value for money, I think, is really quite good because you do get what you pay for. Like I said earlier, this is a quality model. You do have that die-cast running plate. It's beautifully detailed. The mechanism has had some real thought put into it and the performance is second to none as well. So while it is an expensive model, I am going to give this four star on value for money because I do think it was worth what I paid for it. To get five star, it would have needed that extra die cast, I think, because that would have really, really justified the price. But overall, I don't think the price is too bad, which is not usually the case, in my opinion, for Backman. Overall then, that is a very, very good score of 9.07 out of 10. Let's put that into the ranking then. There it is, fourth, just above the Rapido J70 and below the Dapple Terrier. So it did make the top five. The only snag with that is that I have already recorded my top five locomotives of 2020, which means this locomotive will not be in that video. So when you notice that, uh, it's not a scandal against Batman. It's purely because I didn't have the model at the time of filming that video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to carry this loco forward into the 2021 rankings so that it gets a chance of appearing in the top five next year. It's a pain about that, but I do like to get my Christmas videos filmed in advance so that I can actually have a bit of time off over Christmas. There we go, well done Backman, a superb model, absolutely love it, looks wonderful and runs fantastically as well. Well done Backman, more of the same please. Well, that was shockingly good, wasn't it actually? I thoroughly enjoyed looking at that one. My only hope now is that Backman announce and produce more of these so that those that want to get one can do so because yeah, we've got the same old supply issue of them all just being sold out straight away. And obviously that's no good when people 
discover this beautiful hobby. It would be nice if they could actually buy the lovely Locos without having to, say, pre-order months in advance just to secure one. But yes, marvellous model. Really, really enjoyed that one. Thank you so much for watching, folks. Do let me know down in the comments what you thought about this one. Have you bought one? What are your experiences? If Batman were to make more, would you purchase one for yourself? Do let me know. For now, though, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your company. That is another review over and done with. There are two more reviews still to follow before the end of the year, so don't tune out just yet. Oh, don't do that. And I will see you very, very soon, folks. All right, thanks for watching. Take care. Cheers, everybody.